Stephen. Uh, so I have four very short uh, micro slash flash fiction pieces for you tonight. I'm going to end with one piece from She is a Beast, a different piece that John um, read a little bit for you. Uh, so the first piece that I'm going to read is uh, going to be in a similar vein as She is a Beast, which is a collection of feminist fairy tales. Um, so this story is in a similar vein, but not from the book. Uh, it's called Crying Wolf, and it was published in Resurrection Mag uh, at the end of 2020. And I'll just give a content warning that it does contain references to sexual assault. Crying Wolf, fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a girl, the prettiest who was ever seen. One day, her mother asked her to bring some cakes to her grandmother who lived in the woods. On her way, she met a wolf. He was handsome and charming and offered to play a game. Let's race to see who gets to Granny's first, he said. The wolf arrived first, of course. He swallowed Granny whole, and when the girl knocked on her grandmother's door, the wolf opened it. I win, he said. Then he swallowed her too. Real life. She didn't meet the wolf in the woods, but inside of her house. Her bedroom, in fact. He wasn't charming or handsome or even a stranger. He was Mr. Stevens, her father's best friend. He visited at night when her father had passed out on the couch, crumpled beer cans dripping on the floor, leaving stains that would never come out. The wolf pressed the girl against the mattress, his knee in between her ribs. Don't say a word, he warned. Victim. She said a word, many of them in fact to her parents, but they didn't believe her. Rick wouldn't do that, her father said. Are you sure it was him, honey? Her mother asked. She avoided her daughter's eyes, pretended the purple bruises resembling claw marks on her daughter's thighs were invisible. Wolf. I never touched her, he said. She's the same age as my daughter, Elizabeth. I would never hurt a little girl. Hero. It happened more than once, the girl told the police. She had snuck out of school and walked to the precinct without anyone knowing, certainly not her parents, who she knew would never believe her. I have proof, she said. She pulled out her phone and pressed play. It wasn't hard to get him to confess on tape. His hunger for her was never satiated. He wanted to relive her devouring again and again. After. When the wolf knew he was boxed in, when he knew he was no longer the predator in the woods, but now prey, he said the girl asked for it with her red cheerleader costume. He could say what he wanted, the girl thought. He wouldn't get the chance to hunt girls anymore where he was, and that was the only ending she cared about. Thank you. So that's the first piece. Uh, so this next story, uh, I'm still in the process of submitting. It hasn't found a home yet, but hopefully it will soon. Uh, and this story is based off of one of my favorite places in Philadelphia, uh, the Laurel Hill Cemetery. This is called Namesake. You named me after three tombstones in Laurel Hill Cemetery. Your freckled hand on your swollen belly, your light gray eyes scanning the marble and granite slabs, you were running out of time. You said it was the touch of cinnamon in the August air. Autumn was coming early, and so was your baby. I pictured you like this, your strawberry blonde hair aflame in the boiling summer sun, your bangs glued to your forehead in thin strings. At St. Mary's, the other girls called me Soprana. I tried to tell them that Sophrana came from the ancient Greeks, meaning sensible and self-controlled, but they were just little girls, given names like Sally and Christy and Tara and Joan. On my 13th birthday, you wrote to tell me the origin behind my middle name, Viola. It had belonged to the daughter of a wealthy stonemason, Viola L. Charles. The L stood for Lucretia. They lived on the cusp of the city near the cemetery at 18, Viola drowned in the Schuylkill. She wanted to prove to her father she was as good a rower as her older brother, John. 
There was a dense fog that morning and Viola's boat hit a rock, tossing her overboard. Being a woman in a family that cherished men, no one had ever thought to teach her how to swim. You said it was a sad story, but important nonetheless. Viola was fearless and I should be too. Your letter arrived on Thursday, three days before my 18th birthday. The yellow envelope reeked of earth and incense. Lavender fell, then faded parchment. I knew you lived in a small community in upstate New York. Sister Constance called you hippies. Her face pinched as she spoke. You said you lived with free thinkers, that one day I could visit. Yet you had never visited me. I enrolled the letter, spellbound by its contents. You wanted to meet on my birthday at the cemetery where you named me. There, you said, you would tell me the origin of my surname, Wood. My chest hummed with longing. My hands trembled, reaching out to the mother I'd never met. I find Jeremiah Wood's tombstone, taking the path you described. The stone is speckled with time and bird droppings. Born June 6, 1801, died January 7, 1845. My fingers hover over the grave, daring to caress it. He was an artist, you say, from behind me. Your voice is huskier than I imagined. I study the name and dates carved into the stone. He painted murals before the city was covered in them. I wanted you to be creative. My heartbeat th thrums in my fingers. I turn to face you. Your eyes are dark blue with thin lines crowding the skin around them, your hair a deep mahogany. You are nothing like I imagined, nothing, looking nothing like me, yet still, you're my mother. Hi, mom, I say. You smile, the lines by your eyes deepening. So thank you, that's the second piece. So I'll read just one more piece before I get to a very short one from She is a Beast. Uh, this story is called Flower Box and it was published in Yes Poetry. On a Monday, my husband comes home with supplies. From the bed of his truck, he unloads a plethora of wood, redwood, cedar, Douglas fir. He chatters their names and properties to me. It is though new life has been breathed into him. It is the first time he seemed happy since B. On a Wednesday, I wake to the percussion of hammering. I lean in the back doorway of the house, my hand a visor to shield my eyes from the early morning sun. He had told me what he planned to build, but it had seemed so imaginary, like everything since B. On a Friday, he plants a completed flower box in front of my scrambled eggs and coffee. I nod at it, try and fail at a closed mouth grin. I'm not sure the muscles in my face remember how to do that. Can you forget how to smile? My husband beams at me all teeth and I want to return his joy, but there is no warmth in my chest, only caverns and echoes. On a Sunday, he calls me outside, voila, he says, his arms waving in a great flourish. He thinks he's a great showman. Nothing seems great or even good to me anymore, so I simply nod. He has filled his first planter, made from cedar, with an array of colorful flowers, geraniums that remind me of red lollipops, cotton candy pink petunias, grape-colored zinnias, he is the Willy Wonka of flowers, it seems, a caricature of himself. With my tongue, I form the words, it looks nice, honey. I shape the syllables two, three times before venturing to speak. My husband needs a win, and I want to give him that. But then I see the white chrysanthemums slipped in among the candy flowers. For Bethany, he says, seeing I've noticed, they were her favorite. Her sugary, syrupy voice calls me saying, look, mommy, look at me. Her head thrown back in laughter as she swings on the monkey bars in defiance of gravity in the unwavering belief that she at age seven was invincible. The cavities in my chest throb, the stalactites tremble in their plots. I work to form the words, my tongue folding and bobbing in my mouth. 
I know my husband built the flower box in honor of B and what he thought to be a nice gesture. I try to tell him it looks nice, honey, or thank you, but when I look at the cedar box with the candy flowers, all I can see is a coffin, another coffin for B. Thank you. So just one more piece, and this one will be from She is a Beast. Um, and uh, John had actually, this is, he has the poster version of this story, um, which is faux fairy tale. Um, this is a reimagining of Sleeping Beauty. Uh, and you will see that it is a, thank you, John. <laughs> yes. You will see that uh, this is a very different type of Sleeping Beauty than you might be familiar with. Uh, so this is faux fairy tale. You stand over me like I'm a sleeping child, something precious and simple and beautiful. I may be sleeping, but I am no child, nor am I anything like you think I am. Your breath is loud and heavy, like a saw chewing through wood, its appetite never satisfied. I wish you would shut your mouth or stop breathing, whatever quiets you faster. Did you eat a dead raccoon on your way here? Because your breath smells like rotten onion and garlic and meat. As your stink spews onto my face in thick puffs, you say, damn, you're beautiful. You say the things I'd like to do to you. I can hear your fat, sweaty tongue licking your lips. You say these things to me, your voice booming, echoing off the stone walls and floor. Yet your words are the kind of truth People only speak when they know you're full of cough medicine or tequila, having the deepest sleep of your life, or when they whisper so low, the quiet pop of their lips brushing against each other is the only thing audible. You don't think I can hear you. You think our love story starts after the kiss, and anything before is unseen, unheard, a ghost that can be banished with ease. Like the others, you're an idiot. I can hear every fucking word you say. You think you're the first to hack away the thorny hedges and to climb the 20 foot iron gates. You think you're the first to find me, a seemingly perfect woman in a lavish bedroom chamber, one who's alive yet unconscious, one who's silent, just how you like her. You think you're going to save me as though I'm not exactly where I want to be. I'm telling you, buddy, you don't want to kiss me. You don't want to wake me up because if you do, you'll learn real quick that I don't match up to your image of me. I am loud and crude and I won't let you fuck me the way you like. And I refuse to call you daddy or big boy or any other gross dirty talk you're into. So let's just skip the shit, shall we? Don't lay a finger on me. Don't bring that wheezing, rank smelling mouth near me and nobody gets hurt, okay? This won't end in happily ever after. I can promise you that. So thank you so much. Um, so like John said, uh, my book, She is a Beast, is available to order. You can order it either through a novel idea or directly through the publisher, APEP Publications. Um, and then just the last thing I want to say is that um, through a novel idea, I'm actually hosting a reading on Friday called Through the Woods, which is featuring um, Rachel Hanlon Rodriguez, who's on this call somewhere, as long as myself and some one other wonderful writers reading work inspired by fairy tales. I'll drop the link in the chat to that if you're interested, but otherwise, thank you so much. So I'm gonna start at the beginning of the book, Portrait, Trailer of Cows. I spent all morning making sense of my goodness. Already at the bottom of the hill, I slowed coming to the light. And waiting my turn, I thought about obstacles as a sedan lurched into my path. I thought about crushing what was in front of me. I tried to decide how I felt about competition and who deserved what and what I was willing to do to win. I spent too much time driving around angry collecting names of towns where I will exile those who have wronged me. Accelerating, I passed a flatbed truck, its cargo of dead cows not quite covered with an orange tarp. I want to describe one cow in detail. It's one eye wide open and dripping thick mucus, flies gathering around the moisture, drinking in their fill. 
one fly just escaping a festering cut when the tarp slaps down in a gust of wind, but that didn't happen. What must matter here to me now is the truth, even as I too sometimes want a better story. It matters what I could actually see and why. I drove past a trailer of slaughtered cows on a country road and I wouldn't have noticed if I weren't looking in the mirror for a car I thought I had cut off. And all I could see was one cow whose head escaped like a gasp of air from under the tarp, its nose nearly falling off the edge of the truck before I turned back to my life and back to the road. In the moments immediately following, as I drove away, I saw the cow's head. I watched it bounce dead on the trailer. This was a, 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 a literary joke that I was thinking of, Joanne, when you were reading your poem about uh, the heroine, I was thinking I have some poems with heroin in them too. And this is one, but I, it's a different heroine. No one is proud. No one is proud of drug addiction or a son with addiction or a cousin who stops calling his mother. No one is proud of an accident. No one is proud their grandmother was mean like a dog, a secret smoker. No one spends Saturdays talking about house painting, how they would have made it pro at house painting if they could have figured out school and going to class more times than not. No one is proud as they get hooked on painkillers, wrapping car after car around the same tree. No one I know goes to church and believes much, but it's nice to see everyone no one likes when they can't find a job and spend hours surfing the internet for what might take them away a little, feel a certain way or feel anything at all, even if it's anger. No one likes anger. No one likes losing it at their kids, throwing their kids toys that were left on the GD ground again. No one likes slamming doors, broken door jams, leaving the television on for hours, passing in and out of sleep, watching the game. And what kind of a game is it anyway? The warm hours fading when someone comes home in a tone already, already, already at it again. I don't want to hear it, have already heard it enough anyway. Let's have it out, have the fight no one wants to have. My parents were throwers. They didn't brag when the doors slammed shut, when someone turned again, needing to make clear what they said, which was always, I'm scared. I'm so scared. I'm so very scared we might not make it. Um, this is a bit of a companion to that one, an elegy in anger. So what? He died. So what? Before we knew they'd cremated him. So what? There were no pictures. And I spent the first week searching the internet to prove he'd lived. So what? I wanted to see what he looked like with his kids what he and his wife looked like. I wanted to know if his family liked him, if you could tell they liked him in their faces. Have you heard someone calls to say, and I say yes, and then someone else calls and someone else after that. So what, at Christmas at my brother's house, someone from high school makes a joke about how he probably was dead. So what, I said, he is dead. And we laughed. Didn't he die in the truck with his father, kicking empties out the open door so our feet could hit the floor mats? Or was it in the basement where we'd get drunk and he stole a car to get smokes? I went for a run today. So what? Am I not allowed to step heavily like the elephant I've become as the orchestra of grasshoppers sang in the tall yellow grass? I ran down 
a path to a river and stood panting as the temperatures turned and fog rolled in. I have always tried to love the hardest men, the unlovable men. I started early. I would not do it differently. The picture I eventually found is of him in front of a house backlit wearing a mask. He is he was a house painter. He made the world more ordered and beautiful. He looked like a monster from a nightmare movie in the moment the fun is about to begin. Um, one more uh, uh, poem about my good friend from high school who um, uh, we lost to addiction at this point a number of years ago. Um, and it had been a decade before that that I had last talked with him, which was an okay thing. Um, but it's a Philadelphia poem, and uh, it's about the um, the river walk. It's not really about the river walk. It takes place on the river walk. Not that anybody would know that, um, and not that the river walk was even a thing when this poem was written. You might ask how we made it submit. You might ask how we got to the river or what we found there and weren't we worried. Someone might have beat us to it, found it first by the flood wall that there might have that they might have waited for us, recognized us, turned on us. You might correct me, say back then the river was undeveloped with its current condos and storefronts and walkways and gardens. You might point to the one building growing moss up its brick exposed back. You might say not unaccusingly that if we arrived when the trains arrived whistling and pouting the way trains do, we would be nearly all to ourselves in daylight as the shadows of the overpass and the music of the highway stretched toward us, alone with the fumes and whatever the green algae on top of the water smelled like that day, this day, any day, you might ask, were we alone then as you are now? You might ask, did it did we do it out of anger or was it out of fear or resentment or some other abstraction you imagined? You might ask what we got out of it pointedly. You might ask, did it get me off? Did I get off on the way it looked or cowered? You might ask, did I insist on submission? You might ask if at first it looked alive. You might ask, did I think it was alive? Even in the end, knowing what it looked like later, past the end, the end after the end, if you will, or what it sounded like when I called it, when its mother was dying, when it couldn't speak for longer than three minutes. You might ask what the terms were, the penalties for disagreeing or not disagreeing, for going against, for loyalty or disloyalty. You might ask, have I walked there recently where the city has grown up around our youth? And I would say, yes, it is different. Graffiti on the trains, tall glass buildings and new glass buildings. The city, I would say, is a new place. And so am I, the line of flesh breaking through the moss, a bit of blood and gut vine growing up the building's spine and the music of something breaking. I know what we agreed to was complete, was devastating and imprisoning. I will say you'll lose equally what you gained here. You wanted me to tell you what we wanted. We wanted everything in the pre-muzzle morning and in the afternoon when it was still pre-human, when its sounds were bird-like and its shape unclear. how I'm doing here. Oh, there we go. All right. So uh, 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 I think I'll give you a taste of um, the end of the book, which is these four bear poems. Um, Christmas Eve of uh, Warren, did it happen for you on Christmas Eve? The uh, 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 Best American? Oh wow! It, it was around that time, but I don't think. Yeah. It was so Christmas Eve, I get I get this uh, um, super cryptic email 
through my website, which nobody ever goes to, especially before I had a book, nobody had any reason to go to my terrible website. And uh, um, it's from, uh, um, it's, a Mar it's Mark Bibbins, right? Mark, I'm forgetting Mark's first. Anyway, it says, you know, I want to include you in, a, uh, in an anthology right back to me. And I, and I thought to myself, this is a joke. Uh, I thought this is such a cryptic, weird email. Why is somebody scamming me about poetry? That just seems cruel. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, but I just say that because, like, you know, it was it was like uh, January third that I got the call about um, the Philip Levine Award, um, and uh, uh, so that really it was like um, a sequence of ten days that all this really cool stuff happened for me. And Joe, Joe, you must be a Philip Levine reader. There's no way that you're not with that poem that you read. You're on mute, but I think that that's a yes. I think I can't, I just, you know, you, yeah, 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 right. Me too, Philip Levine was my first poetry love. And I recently went back and, and read some of the, some of the like hits you know, to my students because they don't necessarily. So I read like, you know, what work is and uh, um, and I had a revelation about that poem. And then I read, uh, um, of course, um, They Feed, They Lion. And it's, it's an unbelievable poem. It's just, it just comes from a different place, They Feed, They Lion than anything I've ever read before. So, um, uh, and and when I was in college and and my teacher said, you don't read any of the things we give you to read. And I said, I hate everything you give me to read. They gave me Philip Levine. So uh, he saved my life in a way, I guess. Um, so the, the book ends with, it's got two poems after the bear poems because the bear poems are a little bit too pessimistic for the end of the book, but it's got these four bear poems and one uh, one is training and one is um, from the perspective of uh, the crowd once he's dead and one is from the executioner and one is from the ringmaster. Uh, so it kind of gives you a, a sequence of systems of oppression a little bit uh, bare. It wasn't hard getting him to behave. They brought him in from the cold and already he was thankful. When they starved him, he imagined he didn't need food. And when they ignored him, he knew it was because someone somewhere else required their attention. He lay by their feet, learning their rules. He crawled under the bed when they yelled, assuming it was his mistake. He was such a stupid bear. When they poked at him, he assumed it was the oddness of his flabby body, his oversized muscles, the thickness of his hair bunched and caked with blood, spit from cleaning himself, locks where he couldn't, that he should be ashamed of. He was so ashamed. He had a hard time making sense when they shaved him, sent him out on stage, but he knew they had their reasons. When they turned off the house lights so he couldn't see the gathered crowd, he started to roar, knowing he could be the monster they had come to see. He thought, I should always be the show. He learned to dance, he learned to twirl, to know instinctively what was around him without looking. He learned to never ask questions. But when they asked him, he could lie down, he could stand and straighten his back, he could look happy or almost human. When they brought in another bear, he became sad beyond any sadness he had felt in years. When he got old, when his muscles tired, when they needed his warmth, he let them take a knife to him. Make it slow, he said, becoming their new skin. He licked at their necks. He lay peacefully over them, keeping them warm. Thank you.
interesting arc to it. All of these poems are featured in open source, uh, the full length collection that is set to release in uh, fall of this year. And um, first section is uh, mostly poems about Philly. So uh, this is Philadelphia poem. You don't have to fear losing a city if you are one. The new ribbit of the key card station is instantly a token imprint. The eagle shades leaning Heather again. Every hole in the block is a house full of memory. My ghost lives on that balcony still in the back of my head, last administration, and before the crack vials popped again under my mountain bike tires. My underchin is smooth on the entrance of the porch. The wrought iron only feels real or crumbling under my hands like a fall bark. My mom and dad are still beautiful. The hood is still punk and everything is exactly the same as pineapple taste and evergreen stank and the sun. It is beautiful out and the people still screw face when you look in too long. It spooks me how now the only answer left is to beatbox and whistle my moment song to the trolley stop. And if you want to keep hitting your kid for dancing too hard, I just got to leave that one with God. I miss New York street performers, and that's about it. When it cracks 80 at rush hour for the first time in months and the underground sweats, the fades are fresher, and the university walks clamor with pastel aviator glasses and ever clear fumes. I still wear black, light jackets. Patent leather looks right to me. It's only mid-April. There's still time. So either tomorrow or the day after is the uh, anniversary of the first day of lockdown. So uh, this was a poem, one of the few poems that I, that I wrote to completion uh, last year. Uh, and it was written on the first day of lockdown and it's called the first day of lockdown. The roar of the motorcycle gangs is the best way to divide the day's beats, their faces black with masks hiding from the breeze. Meanwhile, a boy yells at the air ahead of him on a wobbly bike. All the few walkers, all in the confused outerwear, shuffle as if there's nowhere to go, because there's not. It would be unseasonably warm if seasons existed. Winter now, a loose collection of harvest stories jutting against the black ink of an arbitrary Wednesday. Time isn't a thing today, as the phones lie still, and my echo finds its connection to the cloud blocked behind a red warning ring. In my backyard between Newport puffs, my eyes settle on the oldest tree I've ever seen in the hood, a craggy shit brown fractal of ivy cover covered fingers etching uh, etched inside the dividing line of an even older chain link fence. Smoking is my only vice today, but the worst letting my lungs shunt against a, per a strange particulate of grain as the one unwashed surface chance says I will miss waits for my touch. Uh, this is the poem that uh, is in Best American Poetry this year, uh, which I got noticed from just through a random Facebook Messenger uh, message from somebody that I'd never met before uh just saying that they had good news so and to give them my email so i did and and that was that was cool super cool um i actually wrote this poem in a workshop uh that sonia sanchez was hosting back when sonia sanchez was the uh was the poet laureate of uh of philadelphia and it started from a prompt uh that she gave of a photograph that she found at a yard sale it's called meditations on a photograph of historic real women. Number two from the right was an angry drunk. Number one from the left always held the face of a dead cousin in her left pocket. The third woman placed fourth in a seed spitting contest at age six. The first one knew she was the prettiest. The fifth didn't need to know. The child belonging to the one on the far right worked in a general store as a bag boy. The first daughter was too rough looking. She lived to be 61. 
The second woman had no children. She spent five minutes picking the right shovel. It was black as her hands. This was not the first time she swung metal things from the waist. The first woman's head wrap was a dish rag she grabbed just before leaving. The second woman's head wrap was a gift from a long dead suitor. The center woman's head wrap was a prop. The second from the left quit two days in. The first preferred to use a wrench. The center woman got the second to do her work for her. The first wouldn't stop for all the money in the world. Right from the center's brother was a saint who shot himself last year. The fourth girl from the right gave up on God a long time ago. The fifth girl was a woman by the time she was 13. The fifth from the other side decided she would never grow up as soon as the papers were signed. I think the second had money saved, but had something to prove. The fourth from the fourth looked like a Virgo. The second woman was raped. The first woman was raped. At least three were raped and during the interview, four said they once knew true love. A white woman slapped two for being insolent. The middle lady shot a nigga. The last woman fondled her cousin when she was young. Is that the same cousin who died? Is the last woman dead? My grandmother is 86. I have no pictures of her, but I do know her name. Her name is Ruth. She loves God more than life and calls young black men monsters every time I come. She grew up on a Virginian farm. She is separated from, but on good terms with my granddad. My granddad's name is Sonny. My granddad can't read. He would look hard at the caption for this photo of nameless women and say, I'm sorry, Warren. I don't have my glasses on me. Why don't you just tell me what it says? The perfect lawn. Hell is learning we always lived in paradise, tending the perfect long Kentucky blue and even halting any weed green launching imperfectly, spread science on it until it's a sea of concrete between chain link fence. Hope is raking the last leaf, looking out at your reef made of man the ground gurgling pleasure into your exposed soul for a weekend. Say any, say a name more perfect than home, safe, clean, controlled, and I will tell you who to kill. Blackmail. When a black man wins, it's a incredible impossible. An introduction to a previously unseen door that should in fact be a hallway overflowing with white women if this in fact were a just world. When a black man fails, my sister tells me about niggers on the phone through a half smirk. Black Twitter intones the biblical curse again and America sighs into its work week knowing the demon by name. When a black man lives, he's not a black man, he's a book. He's his mama's gym and thank God he married well. The idea of a success as a failure in an art piece made out of shit. When a black man dies, I get coffee. They toss so much ash in the air, everyone becomes black for a month. My hood is West Virginia. Everyone knew when the t-shirts fade, that deadbeat nigga was no saint. This poem's called Fuckboy. My friend loved just breathing in the bathhouse with long meandering weave of thoughts while a lonely man moaned lost into the linoleum. I bought him earrings made of black lava stone, one of my first Christmas gifts. And that was not until I was 33, small penises are such tender thumbs. He wouldn't kiss me in the bar we were regulars at, and he's the gay one. I've given up on believing there's order to the world. We both want black women and kids. I experimented because that's what black men are, an experiment in trust. He loves black men. 
I lean over him in Texas watching the build of his joy. I felt like such a slut feeling everyone should come, not by me necessarily, but at least I wanna know about it, that everyone ruptures someday, build in the disappearing of this harsh view of the world, Sunday light, unconscious, toothy smile. By hood two. Pressing chunks of scab onto into toy microscope slides is a kind of sexuality. Lust as in a body, what can a body do? A body is the only skin it is safe for me to touch. Don't look with lust cause wanting in your heart is when the innocence flakes off your frame in chunks. Instead, look at yourself. My body evolved into a trigger that springs back funny. I noticed too early it became a symbol and then a scary way to measure time. If you see me wilt avocado green and it looks nice, there's a point you can push in my bowels where a, a switch flips soft, milky gray. Leading is nice, but loose drool on a warm baby cheek is a sweet place for a black boy to sleep. The dream where I'm a house mouse blessed with a stockpile of toasted crumbs nooked behind a small crown molding, plump rodent pet twitch, clever nuisance, nooseless and too cute for any evil consequence for approaching a stranger and saying yes. And one, maybe two, we'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. This is postmortem. You don't have to look good. No, I'm not gonna do this one. I'm gonna do this one. This is, uh, this is my last one. Um, and this is the Tuesday I finally gave up. Mrs. Mary's bony shoulder tints a faded tea and rosary beads. Waves slow. My head cranes soft, turning at mid asphalt from the perch of my corner porch. Oh, my still uncolonized street. Her grandbabies bounce unhurried and teetering. I weave on a single gear towards the park. The masked readers there crowd in distant pairs and someone in the bowl of grass to the south might fly a kite. I've seen it once on a walk. I'm teaching online full time now to a gaggle of Midwestern adults. Since the start of class, three funerals and two babies born. I shout out if I'm clear through Bluetooth buds and the gallery of places blink on and raise their thumbs. I play Afrobeat between lecture notes. I play the drums today. Today, I didn't think about my ex. Being single doesn't kill you and the sun doesn't know anything. There's still whiskey to kill. A friend I cry over, I'm so grateful, posted a square composition of sidewalk three minutes ago on the gram. And it is asymmetrical, intrinsic, and God as any unt idle, untamable weed. Thank you. <laughs>